is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome, everybody, on this Easter Sunday, this day of resurrection, this day that we celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rising from the dead, this day that I like to call the Super Bowl of the Christian church. This is our big day. This is the day that we can declare boldly and proudly that hope wins, that joy wins, that love wins, and no matter what this world throws at us, God has the last word. Amen? But we have to make sure we spell it properly. I saw a meme on Facebook a week ago that said, Chris has risen. I think they forgot the T, and the caption just said, congratulations, Chris. So once again, welcome on this Easter Sunday. You'll notice in your pews, in the little boxes, we have visitor cards. I invite you to fill one out. If you haven't filled one out before, drop it in the collection plate. We also continue to have a basket up here that we started during Holy Week, and this is for uh, Ukraine. Uh, the United Methodist Church, our relief agency, is the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and every single penny of what's donated uh, is going to our brothers and sisters over there. So with that said, our greeting in our bulletin, which is on our screen, and hello to the people watching on the, the internet or the interweb. Uh, all of our services are on Facebook, and they've been emailed out. Our greeting this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, and I will read, and you are welcome to respond. Christ is risen. Bringing joy, hope, and the promise of new life. May this day be a celebration of God's abiding presence in our lives and in our world. The family that prays together stays together. It's been a real inspiration for me these past few weeks to see people in the country of Ukraine going into their churches and praying. Going into their churches and worshiping, and unfortunately going into their churches to do funerals. Their faith has been tested but it's strong. The family that prays together stays together. Our prayer this morning comes from Psalm 118 and again John chapter 20. Won't you pray this prayer with me on this blessed day of resurrection? God of new life and new hope, we gather to sing to our songs of gladness and to share your steadfast love. Some of us come from the shadows of our lives as we anticipate the light. Some of us come eager to learn, but are unsure of what it all means. Some of us come in grief, grateful to discover hope. Wherever we have come from, may we all find you, the risen Christ, the one who conquered death and proclaims new life for all. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, one of the traditions of many Christian churches the world over for centuries is either during worship or when we gather, extending a sign of, of Christ's peace and love with each other. Often what we say is the peace of Christ be with you or something of that nature. I know we're still teetering, hopefully getting through COVID. So I'd invite you as you're able to stand, if you want to hug, if you want a handshake, fist bump. I've seen this. I think this is Morgan Mindy. I don't know what that is, but if that works for you, let us greet each other on Easter, the love of Christ. <laughs>
worship found in your bulletin and on the screen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. You know, just when I opened up um, my email this morning, I did a daily devotion. And it was written by Max Lucado. And he says, Easter is a love story written for you. He did it just for you. When he died, so did your sin. And when he rose, so did your hope. So I want to wish all of you a very happy Easter. May you find renewal in your hope and your love for Jesus Christ today and in the coming weeks. And since, since you went off, off, uh, off course, I never go off script, right? Deb, Deb just got the scan results back and found out that her cancer has shrunk in 30%. So. And now we are blessed to have our choir this morning perform acclamation for Easter.
before the kids come up and as the choir is shuffling down, I have a special video to show you because have you ever asked your kids to explain something and they really explain it completely wrong? Has that ever happened to you before? They tell you a story and you're like, yeah, the details here are way wrong. So this is a bunch of kids telling us the Easter story at, at another church and I just thought it was cute. I wanted to show it to you before our kids come up. <laughs>
That's exactly what we get. Now, Miss Deb and, and Mr. Dwayne, I think if he helped, right? We have uh, what okay, Easter bags for you? Do you want it? Oh, the teachers too? And if we don't get Sunday school today. Oh. Just the kids or the teachers too? This is from Oh, okay. From the teachers. Do you want to tell them what you're getting? Or? But, well, since we don't have Sunday school, um, we put together just some little Easter bags with some activities and a snack for you to have while you're in church this morning. So happy Easter. this morning. You can look at your insert in your bulletin, and in your insert uh, you'll see a whole bunch of announcements. You'll see the things coming up this week, like the men's lunch, which is Thursday at the golf course clubhouse, which means, Dick, you need to be at the table, not on the golf course. If you come in with cleats on and a putter, we know what you've been up to, okay? <laughs> so, um, so those are the things going on. You can, you can look at your insert. Any announcements this morning on this Easter Sunday? Okay, well, uh, a great hymn written by a good Methodist, uh, John Wesley, a British uh, priest, the founder of the Methodist movement. His brother Charles was quite the hymn writer. He wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing. He wrote all different hymns, and one of the most popular ones he wrote is Christ the Lord is Risen Today. So 302 in your UMC hymnal will be on the screens as well. I'd invite you as you're able on this day of resurrection to stand and sing with me.
sing that again. I love that song. <laughs> Just some uh, joys and concerns on this Easter Sunday, this day of resurrection. Continued prayers for not only the people of the Ukraine, but also the people of Russia. Both uh, people are suffering uh, in different measures, of course. Uh, but continued prayers for an end to this brutal war. Continued prayers for an end to all the killings and all the violence. Uh, what a tragedy and what an awful thing to behold. Continued prayers for Bertha Jensen, for Jack Doyle, Deb Fermata, my stepdad Mike Terrio, and also Beatrice Hyde, who are all going through cancer treatment. But Deb is beating cancer with a big stick. Well, good for you. Everyone's welcome at this church except the two C's, COVID and cancer. We don't want them here. Uh, continued prayers for Tammy Hood. Uh, I went to see Les Gregory this past week at Chestnut Park Nursing Home. He's a young 99 years old now. And I let him know that the next time I see him, if he has one of the older ladies that live there in his room and they're kissing each other, I'm going to turn around and walk out. And Les said, well, good to know, Pastor. Good to know. So uh, I don't think he'll do that, hopefully. Uh, but if you want to if you want to visit him or call him there, I'm sure he'd love to see you. Continued prayers for people facing natural disasters, fires, hurricanes, all of these kinds of things. Continued prayers for Tatiana Vanna, for Jed Michael. Uh, Sue Chinister, uh, one of our one of our members, she's in uh, the hospital, uh, Bassett in Cooperstown. She's hoping to come home tomorrow, so just prayers for her. Uh, Theo, uh, Peggy Stilson's son, has is retaining some fluid and might have pneumonia. You said he's in the you said he's in the hospital, right? Peggy, your son. Okay, so prayers for him. Other uh, joys and concerns this morning. Yeah. All we celebrated our 54th wedding anniversary. Your 54th wedding. When was that? Yesterday? Oh. Well, I don't want to be nosy, but I, I would just keep them at this point, you know? <laughs> my, my grandma said of my late grandma once, she's like, I could get a new one, but it's like a shoe. It's going to take a while to, to work it in. This one's old and beat up, but it's very snug and it fits well. So, so <laughs> you'll stick with what you got. Well, happy anniversary. Other, yes? Yesterday was that's right, Matthew. What are you, you're 45 now? No? 31. 31. Well, that, Matthew, we're getting old, aren't we? So, are you still a Yankees fan? Yeah. I'll keep praying. Yeah, okay. they, they, <laughs> well, they finally pulled through last night. We, the game we went to, they lost, of course, but last night they won. I, as, as a pastor in uh, Sydney here, I'm a de facto Yankees fan, because if I'm not, I'll, I'll be killed. So, but, but happy birthday. Um, other joys and concerns this morning. Yes? Now, now for concerns. Oh, concerns. Uh, my daughter, my daughter-in-law had risen to the cold out on a Tuesday. Oh and no. She is still numb. Okay. So um, she's on steroids right now. She's got to go back on Wednesday for follow-up, but she, that's that's an awful lot. I is she? Uh, does she have to work while she's doing that? Oh, of course. Well, I when I when I was a social worker, I had a friend that had that happen. Came right back two hours later. He got on the phone and he goes, hi, how are you today? And it was like, it was just, I was, I was laughing and I shouldn't have, but I couldn't understand anything he was saying. So, well, prayers for her that that would, that would improve. Carol. Yes, my niece um, was in a head-on collision. Oh, no. And uh, she, they had to airlift her. When was this? It, it was Thursday. Thursday? Okay. It was a uh, three-car, and uh, they had to airlift three of them to nearby hospitals. Trauma center, and she has um, broken ribs, um, punctured lung, and oh, wow. neck, and spinal injuries. I am so sorry to hear that. But on the good note, all of them that were in the accident are alive. So. Praise God. All right, well, thank you. We'll, we'll be praying for her. Yes, Bill. thank you because you are good, because you love us, because you are a God of resurrection and life and new hope. We thank you, God, for the blessings in our lives, that we have clothing on our backs, food in our stomachs, roofs over our head, and warm homes on a particularly chilly Easter Sunday. We have so much to be thankful for, God. There are things we could complain about or gripe about, but we really, when it comes down to it, have it pretty darn good. 
But God, we know that there are people suffering all over the world, near and far, and maybe even right here in this congregation this morning. We pray that you pour your healing and your mercy and your grace on them. And use us as your hands and feet to be bringers of hope, life, mercy, healing, and resurrection. We thank you this day for our Sydney United Methodist Church. And we thank you, God, for the amazing things you continue to do in our church. The continued growth, the baptisms, the new ministries, the joy, and all of the things that we're doing together. As we pray for our sister churches, like Sacred Heart across the street, and all churches near and far. May they be strengthened so our communities may be strengthened and lives might be transformed. On this day, God, we pray for our men and women in uniform, all six branches now of our armed services, as well as our firefighters, EMTs, first responders, police officers, all those people that show up at a moment's notice. We might not know who they are, what they do, but we're sure glad when they get there. We know that we have thousands of soldiers now in Eastern Europe and our NATO allied countries. And we pray, God, that these men and women won't have to go into combat. But we just thank you for all of our men and women in uniform. We know that there's always a few bad eggs, but we know the vast majority of these folks are doing their duty to you, to their country, to honor their family and honor their communities and keep us safe. On this day, this Resurrection Sunday, Lord, we pray for our government, our president, our vice president, our governor, and all of our elected officials. And we pray that you would work through them so that we might have a better tomorrow a more prosperous tomorrow, a tomorrow with no war and no harm and no brokenness. We pray this day, God, for all the oppressed people, people being harmed, people being killed, people being thrown in mass graves, people being treated in ways that are incomprehensible in 2022. Many of these people are in the Ukraine, but they're also in other places. God, may we stand with those people that are oppressed. May we let our voices be known that this is not how children of God live. We pray for Christians all over the world on this Resurrection Day that are oppressed, that just want to share the good news, the love and the hope of Christ, and they want to see peace and prosperity, and they want to see a world transformed. We thank you again, God, for the many manifold blessings you've given us in our lives, and once again, we pray for those who suffer, knowing that you are the, the giver of all good things. Let us unite our hearts, our minds, and our voices now, and say the prayer that Jesus our Lord, the Resurrected One, taught his friends nearly 2,000 years ago. When they said to him, Lord, how should we pray? And he responded with the Lord's Prayer. Let us say this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And Jeff, uh, thanks again for reading scripture today. By the way, did he, did he get you an anniversary gift? We actually took a couple days and went away. That was for our Smart guy. Smart guy. Went Smart. down the land gift. Smart guy. All right, thank you. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Psalm 118. I will be reading verses 1 and 2 and 14 to 24. If you want to follow in your pew Bible, it's on page 534. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. It shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
The New Testament reading comes from 1 Corinthians 15, and I'll be reading verses 19 to 26, and it's found on page 166 in your pew Bible. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in subjection under him. I went a little bit too far. <laughs> anyway, this is the word of God for you, the people of God. You're passionate about reading the Bible. I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm not going to say, don't do that. Um, so one of, the, one of the great Easter hymns that many churches sing, one that I love, and we usually sing it one day a year, uh, is 322 in our United Methodist symbols in your pews. It's also on the screen. Up from the grave we arose. Let's stand as we're able and sing this together on this resurrection. <laughs>
standing for a reading from the Gospel of St. John. We stand for the Gospel because it's the words of or attributed to Jesus Christ. All four of the Gospels in the New Testament discuss the resurrection. Today I'll be reading from John 21 to 18, page 108 in the Red New Testament Bible, and also on the screen. Let us hear what God's Word has to say to us on this resurrection day. Early on that first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who loved Jesus, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as far as they did not understand the scripture, he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look at the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them, that he had said these things to her. Once again, the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, once again, dear friends, on this Easter or Resurrection Sunday, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Happy Easter. And I hope on some level we all feel resurrected too, because this is the first Easter I think we've had in two or three years where we're not all dressed up like bank robbers. We don't have masks on. Okay, the first Sunday we came back after the shutdown, everyone had a mask on, and I felt like I was a bank teller getting held up. And I just told everybody, just in case you're wondering, I have no money in my pockets. So, good news that we're not required to wear masks anymore. Certainly the ones that want to are welcome to do that. Probably also good news for people that work at the bank, because now you know, now you know more clearly who's going to rob you and who's not. Well, sometimes, friends, I don't know about you, the night gets the darkest right before the dawn. Sometimes when all hope is lost and we don't think anything good can happen, that's when a miracle occurs. Sometimes when we least expect it, when we think nothing good is possible and everything is gone to pot, as the term goes, we have a resurrection. This day in the life of the Christian church, I would argue, is not just a historical event. It's a transformative event. It happened in Jerusalem, a place up until then that most people knew little about. And today, 2,000 years later, one-third of the world's population, almost 2.5 billion people, claim to be Christians. Quite a transformative day, wouldn't you say? Historians don't debate whether the tomb was empty. We know that. They might debate where Jesus went. But clearly this day, the stone had been rolled away. Jesus had a three-year amazing ministry on earth. He loved, he healed, and he forgave. This past Thursday, he was in the upper room with his disciples. He gave them the gift of the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. He washed their feet. He gave them the commandment to love each other. And then the next day, a few days ago on Good Friday, 
was arrested and almost all of his followers, except John, the disciple, and some of the women, they ran. They were in hiding. They didn't know what to do. They thought this three-year run had come to an end, but it's just like all things on this earth. Nothing lasts forever. A good friend of ours who passed out in glory a few years ago, Reverend Bob Pinto, he was in a college class once, and since he was a Christian, the philosophy professor gave him a hard time and said, you know what, Bob, there is no absolute truth. And Bob looked at him and he said, are you absolutely sure about that? And then the professor just laughed. For 2,000 years, Christians have claimed on this day that Jesus rose to new life. It's not just an event. It's not just something we mark on our calendar when it's on the wall and it says Easter Sunday. Of course, we added the whole bunny thing, which I'm still confused about. I like Cadbury eggs. Anybody else? But I'm confused. Bunnies don't even lay eggs, you know? And I remember, you know, I, I think that the Christmas story is great. We have Santa. We have all of this stuff. Easter bunny. I remember I was five and I asked my mom, how does he get to the house? And she said, the Easter mobile. I said, the Easter mobile? She said, yeah. I said, okay. So there we go. So now we have this tradition of resurrection, but we also have Easter egg hunts and all these other things and jelly beans. I've been preaching a sermon series through all of Lent called New Life is Coming. And I don't know about you, but after all we've been through with this pandemic, after over a million deaths, after continued things going on, a shooting in the subway in Brooklyn this past week, and all the other things that's going on, a war in the Ukraine, how many of you, by a show of hands, ever feel a little discouraged? How many of you, by a show of hands, ever just say, the world we live in is broken and is irredeemable? Why do we even try? Why don't we just go to a little cabin in the woods and say, forget it all, we're going to do our own thing. Today is the reason why we should not do that. Today is the day of resurrection because what today says, friends, is no matter what happens to us, no matter what dictator tries to invade, no matter who oppresses us, no matter who mistreats us, God gets the last word in the end. Amen? When it's all said and done, when the whole story's written, when it comes to its conclusion, hope, love, peace, and mercy will reign, and evil and destruction will be ended. Amen? That is why today matters. It's not just a historical event. It was a transformation in the hearts and the minds of people. And what they said is, in, in Israel at the time, we might be under the yoke of the Roman Empire. They might take all of our money. They might tax us. They might abuse us. But they can't take our souls because those belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And today he is risen. And it's amazing to me that the place where the Roman Caesar was, the one who was oppressing Judea, where Jesus lived, that now that is the seat of the largest Christian denomination in the world, where Caesar used to sit, the one who used to oppress Christians and kill them, now that's the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible says kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Dictators might be roaring and running around this earth, trying to get power, money, and status. But resurrection tells us that God gets the last word. So with that said, in a country like Ukraine, we've seen the images. We've seen the horrors. Are those people dying in vain? Are they forgotten? Is God turning his back on them? And the answer today is no. Because resurrection is real. New life is powerful, and because of that, despite anything that happens in this world, Jesus is alive, he is with us, and new life is promised to us. I don't know about you, but that's good hope. That's good resurrection power. That's the thing that when we turn the news on and we see how bad it is, so bad in fact, we say, I say to Melissa, what if I just throw the TV out the window? And then she goes, Paul, that's stupid, and I don't do it then. But things that even if they get so bad, we still have the hope of God, that God loves us, that God loves us all without distinction, that God doesn't make any junk, and that the God of the universe created you and created you in love. And despite what this world throws at you, God gets the final word. Resurrection gets the final word. And that is the power of the Christian faith. 
that's why today is so significant. It's not just an event, an event. We didn't just go, oh, the dude's gone, the tomb's empty. It's significant because of what it represents. Not to mention that hundreds of people saw Jesus alive after his resurrection. He made, he made breakfast for Peter and the other disciples on the beach. People shook his hand and did all this kind of stuff. Kind of hard to do that when you're dead. But the inspiration and the transformation was just so powerful. And one of the people that's inspired me in this season of Lent, I don't know about you, is President Vladimir Zelensky. Now, I remember when we were pulling our army out of Ukraine or out of Afghanistan, the president there filled two or three vehicles full of bundled $100 bills and within no time was on an airplane and was out of that country. And that country fell in, what, about two weeks? Now, the president of Ukraine certainly could have done that. But you know what he said? He said, I'm staying and I'm fighting for my people. I'm going to stand. The power of resurrection. The belief that you can do anything to me, but you can't take God's love for me. You can't take the hope of Jesus Christ for me, because that is not yours to take. Now, in looking at our gospel lesson this morning, we find a very, very interesting narrative. Number one, let's just own it. The women found the empty tomb first, not the men. All the men were hiding and quaking, and Mary Magdalene went. And then she told Peter and James. They ran in, and they were kind of like, well, we'll just take the credit for this now. Then they go back home, and Mary sees Jesus. And it's not just that the tomb is empty, because initially she thought Jesus' body was taken and stolen. But then she sees him, and then she knows. And next Sunday, when we tell the Doubting Thomas story, Jesus will appear to them and say, Peace be with you, which is why we pass the peace of Christ, and he will blow the Spirit of God on them. He's there to comfort them, to arrive, to show up. If you're sitting in a basement and bombs are dropping, if you're in a place of unimaginable suffering, he is with you. Now, the, the, the interesting thing, though, in this gospel, and this is what I'm going to tell the closing story on this morning, it says that when John went in, he saw that Jesus was gone and his linen wrappings were there. If this is where the body was laid, this is where the body wrappings were. But then it says when Simon Peter came in, he saw the body wrappings here. But then the face covering of Jesus, he said it was rolled up in a place all by itself. Kind of an odd detail to mention. None of the other Gospels mention this. It's as if Jack invites me over for Taco Tuesday. And I go home, and Melissa say, how, says, how was it? The tacos were good, but he put the salsa in a place all by itself. And Melissa goes, well, why would you tell me that? Because it was really good salsa. It's a very interesting detail to mention in our Gospel lesson today. That when Simon Peter goes in, he sees the body wrappings, but the face covering is rolled up in a distinctly different place. Why would he mention such a unique and little and subtle detail? Well, I'm going to share a story on one theory of why this is, a theory I believe, and this I'll share with you in closing on this Easter Sunday. This is what the story says. When Simon Peter arrived after John... He went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered Jesus' head, not with the burial cloths rolled up, but rolled up in a separate place. Why would John have noted the placement of the burial cloths in light of the astonishing fact of the absence of Jesus' body? And why would he have thought it important to include this detail of the events of that first Easter morning? In fact, it was an important detail. According to Father Christian Schenker, the rolling up and the placement of this cloth hearkened, hearkened to a Jewish custom of the time. It related to a common practice used by servants and the masters of the house of this era. A servant, after he had prepared the dining table for his master, would stand to the side, out of the sight of the master. If you've ever, ever seen Downton Abbey, you know what I'm talking about. But attentive to the progression of the meal. He wouldn't dare return to the table until the master had finished his meal. When the master had finished, he would rise up, clean his fingers, mouth and beard, and leave the napkin crumpled up in a ball on the table. The wrinkled, discarded napkin indicated to the servants, I have finished my meal. If, however, for whatever reason, the master left the table with intention of returning, then he would crease the napkin into folds and leave it beside the dish, his dishes. 
This was a message for the servant that he was not to disturb the table, given that the master had indicated, I am returning. This, then, is perhaps the reason John's attention to the detail of our Lord's face cloth. Jesus told them in his words the Son of Man would return. This morning he repeated the promise with, with the seemingly inconsequential and very symbolic gesture of leaving his faith cloth rolled to the side, assuring for us he had not left for good. The face cloth was rolled up because the master of the world, the master of our lives said, I'm not done. I'm coming back to the table. Friends, today is more than a historical event. Today is a transformative event that has transformed billions of people. It's led to the creation of schools and hospitals, and it's taught young girls how to read. It's helped to champion women's rights. It's done all kinds of things because of the power of resurrection. And on this Easter and on this Resurrection Sunday, I, I hope and pray that we can claim this power anew. Because the world needs it. The world needs you. The world needs hope. It needs joy. And most of all, it needs the love of Christ. And Christ is counting on us to go forth from this place and to show that hope. That hope amidst darkness. That hope amidst pain. That hope when nothing seems like it's good. That hope when all seems lost. That hope that is resurrection. With this said, friends, he is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia, happy Easter, and amen. Friends, God is good, and all the time, we give to God, not because we have to, not because we're required to by the IRS. How many of you are happy to pay your taxes this past week, by the way? You are happy to pay your taxes? That's good. Most people I know, they're like, yeah, don't, let's not talk about it, Pastor Paul. So I, I give to God because I believe in what this church is doing. I believe in our amazing food bank. I believe in the many ministries. And I believe that this church is a lighthouse in this community. And I believe without this church, this community would have a gaping hole in it. I give because I believe in what God is doing and the hope that God is using us to offer a broken and hurting world. So friends, on this Easter Resurrection Sunday, let us get to God our tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
Father God, we thank you for this day of resurrection, a day that just isn't a page in history, but is a transformative day that has transformed billions of lives, and we pray it will continue to transform our hearts. I pray on this day, God, that you would take our tithes and offerings, multiply them and stretch them and grow them, not so that the pastor could buy a Maserati or live a fancy lifestyle, so that we can feed the poor, that we can spread the good news, and that we can tell a world that has so much hurt, there is hope, there is an empty tomb, and that you, God, get the final word. In your name we pray. Amen. In Peter's letters, I'm paraphrasing, he said something to the effect of, the greatest person I had ever met in my whole life, the greatest, greatest person I had ever seen, died for me and rose again. He lives. We should have joy on this Resurrection Sunday. 310, our United Methodist hymnal, he lives. Feel free to stay standing and we will sing this together. Stay standing as you're here.
friends, on this day of resurrection, this great celebration in the Christian church, our Super Bowl, we have the affirmation today and always that no matter what happens, no matter what a dictator does, no matter what life throws at us, in the end, when it's all said and done, grace, hope, peace, and love will win. God will win. Goodness will win. Hope will win. Because Jesus, our Lord, is resurrected. Be blessed this day and always, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day of resurrection. We pray that this is not just an event in the pages of history, but something that will transform us, that has transformed billions of people over the, over the eras. And we just pray that we'd be transformed and go forth, loving, healing, and forgiving, knowing that you are risen. And because you are risen, in the end, goodness and mercy and love will win. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.